So, uh, yeah, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm really pleased uh, to introduce uh, Kevin Mitchell, uh, who's Associate Professor of Genetics and Neuroscience at uh, Trinity College, uh, author of Innate. I'll give it a plug. <laughs> Kevin will give it a plug for a while. And he's going to talk to us about the neurodevelopmental part of neurodevelopmental disorders and taking them seriously. Kevin, please. Thanks so much, George, and um, thanks for the invitation, and thanks to all of you here and everyone joining online as well. So, um, yeah, what I want to do is talk about neurodevelopmental disorders, but really emphasize the neurodevelopmental part and ask, what does that mean? What are the implications for um, the work we do in either in research or in the clinic for the fact, you know, from the fact that these things really have an origin in neural development? Um, so first I want to ask, well, what is it that makes a disorder neurodevelopmental? And really, clinically speaking, it's just defined like this, a group of conditions with onset in the developmental period. So that's the main um, criterion. And they, they induce some deficits that produce impairments of functioning. So that, that last bit just means it, that's why it's a disorder, right? Because it has an impairment of functioning. That's why it's not just treated as a difference. Clinically, it's important somehow. Um, but the, the main criterion is just the, the time of onset. So um, what we don't know really just from that is whether that implies that the, the deficits that you see are due to altered neural development itself or just altered functioning that happens to manifest at an early stage. And that's really potentially an important distinction for thinking about therapeutic interventions later on. Um, and there's a, so there's a big list in, in DSM-5 of things that are called neurodevelopmental disorders, and they, they include things like intellectual disability and autism and ADHD and these other um, conditions uh, here. And uh, I would add these kinds of conditions as well, cerebral palsy and epileptic encephalopathies and cortical malformations and um, what, you know, more traditionally neurological as opposed to psychiatric conditions, but I, I think that separation is probably fairly arbitrary. Um, and then there's a bunch of rare syndromes, of course, that, that like Down syndrome and Rett syndrome and Fragile X and so on that are included in this, um, in this group. And one of the interesting things to point out is that pretty consistently, males are more uh, affected by these, or at least diagnosed more frequently than females are, which is a point that I'm going to come back to later on. Now, those, are, those really are um, early onset disorders, but there are later onset disorders that may also have a neurodevelopmental origin. And in fact, people think, uh, at least for schizophrenia, that that's true. Obviously, for Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, things that are really neurodegenerative, that's probably not true. But for major um, sort of categories of psychiatric illness, there may be a neurodevelopmental origin, which just manifests later on in life. So one of the things I want to do is ask whether that's right. Is there really support for that? Um, and if we think about the neurodevelopmental hypothesis of schizophrenia in particular, which is where it's really well developed, there's a number of reasons uh, that people have taken as, as lines of evidence in support of that idea. One is that there are prenatal or neonatal risk factors that have been described. Um, one of them is maternal infection, although I would say now that the initial studies that, that showed a, a risk for that, which were fairly small studies with hundreds of people, have been superseded uh, by very large cohort studies in you know, Denmark and Sweden, which basically show no increased risk for schizophrenia although there may be a small increased risk for autism with maternal infection. Uh, but there are some other um, sort of epidemiological factors that uh, are associated with slightly increased risk of schizophrenia, and it's not really known why that is. There are also some early pre-morbid signs, so just low birth weight, but that's pretty nonspecific. Um, there are social and motor abnormalities 
seen as early as two years, and mostly those are in, in retrospective sort of studies after someone gets diagnosed with schizophrenia or in, in, in large groups of people. Um, so it's a little hard to know um, how to take those, but it does suggest maybe there's, there's a, a lifelong trajectory at play. Um, there's an interesting finding with ADHD diagnosis that it had, ADHD diagnosis during childhood has about a five-fold increased risk of schizophrenia later on, which is pretty stark. Um, suggesting, well, either two possibilities, either, again, that's a trajectory that you're on, which just manifesting in different ways, or having ADHD as a discrete thing is a risk factor for developing schizophrenia as another discrete thing, which I find less likely. Um, also, there, there are some animal models, which are interesting in that um, they have a, an early critical period. So, so if you do, do these sort of ventral hippocampal lesions, for example, um, at an early postnatal period in rats, they will subsequently develop some um, phenotype, behavioral phenotypes that are thought to be potential endophenotypes of psychosis due to pharmacological evidence. Um, but if you do it later on, that that doesn't happen. So there's a critical period and then later emerging pathology, which um, is important because, of course, development doesn't end at birth. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, onset right away for something to be developmental in origin. There's all kinds of um, developmental processes that are still happening throughout the lifetime, especially in, in, um, in the cortex and especially in the prefrontal cortex. So there's new excitatory synapses and then there's lots of pruning of synapses. Um, there's formation of myelin and so on. So you could have deficits that are, are are there in some of those processes, which then manifest with illness at that stage, right? So the, the developmental process itself is the origin of the problem. Or you could have a situation where these processes are going on and they reveal mm -hmm. a latent vulnerability, which was there from earlier on. So for example, a big wave of synaptic pruning might reveal something that was buffered uh, at, at earlier stages. Now, the other way to think about neurodevelopmental disorders is uh, this distinction between rare and common. And rare just means there's a known cause, like fragile X syndrome, and Rett syndrome, and so on. Uh, and there's lots and lots of those, of course. And um, they, they typically have Mendelian inheritance in a broad sense, in that they're associated with one particular mutational event, like an extra chromosome 21, or a, a deletion in a particular gene, or whatever it might be. And then there's these big common categories, the idiopathic ones, which just are really placeholders. They're just descriptors of symptoms where uh, they're just a, it's a big pool. We don't have any other reason to distinguish people within that um, in the absence of any other genetic information. And those are thought to show what's called complex inheritance. So um, from twin and family studies, just looking at those diagnostic labels, they're extremely heritable, especially um, autism, schizophrenia, um, you know, 80 to 90% heritable, which means obviously a huge proportion of the variants in who gets the condition is due to genetic differences. Um, and those twin and family studies generally show no effect of a shared family environment. And the other thing that's important, um, which will be a theme really uh, across the rest of this talk is that the risk extends across disorders. So if you have a first degree relative with schizophrenia, you can see on the right hand side there, your, your um, risk of having schizophrenia yourself is about tenfold what it would be otherwise. But these other bars show that your risk of having intellectual disability or autism or epilepsy or depression is also increased. So there's, there's some common risk, at least um, some common component of risk uh, across all of these conditions. So in thinking about those, those big conditions then, those big idiopathic pools, there's two sort of major models that have been uh, competing, I think, in um, psychiatric genetics for understanding the genetic architecture. One is the multiple rare variance model, where it would be like intellectual disability as a, as a label, where we know it's just a big umbrella group for lots and lots of rare conditions. We just don't know what they are yet. Um, the other is the common disease, common variant idea, where each case would be caused by multiple variants. In fact, maybe hundreds or thousands of variants that are common in the population. And if you pass some kind of burden, then you would um, develop a uh, condition. So the first uh, situation is genetic heterogeneity, and the second one would be polygenicity. <laughs> So um, obviously the, the, the field at large has been doing amazing work with amazing progress and, and success over the last 
20 years or so, trying to identify risk genes. And really the um, rationale for that is to hopefully reveal the underlying biology, whatever that is, and to translate that understanding to the clinic to meet these very significant unmet needs of um, patients. So, so that could be in the form of genetic diagnoses, just understanding what's the, what the causes are, but hopefully some sort of um, translation of that into personalized medicine, maybe on the basis of new therapeutics um, derived from understanding the biology. I think that's been the, well, that's been the stated goal um, of the field. And we'll look later on to see how, um, how things are going with that project. Um, so first of all, finding rare mutations, there are loads and loads of them. Now they've been found sort of historically, initially by cytogenetics, like, um, you know, trisomy 21 or fragile X, then by comparative genomic hybridization, finding deletions and duplications, copy number variants, and more recently through exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing, which really require massive, massive um, samples to find st statistical significance. This is just uh, an illustration of some, you know, deletions and duplications, copy number variants that can arise, um, that can recur at certain sites in the genome because of the um, some repetitive sequences that the recombination machinery gets confused by. So as a result of that, you you get enough instances of the same mutation occurring over and over again in order in order to assess whether it really is. Um, carrying risk. And when people started doing that, they started really with, with autism, finding some um, of these deletions and duplications like 22Q11 and 15Q13.3 and so on, um, which increased risk of autism. But then they soon found they also increased risk of schizophrenia or epilepsy or other kinds of birth defects. Um, and in fact, uh, ADHD and, and, and many other um, supposedly discrete diagnostic categories as well. So if you look at the presentation of any of these um, with patients carrying, say, 22Q11 deletion, what you can see is they can manifest with, with any of these different um, kinds of conditions. And there's a, you know, maybe there's a difference in the, the frequency of the, or the proportion of the relative um, different conditions across those. But generally speaking, they all predispose to pretty much all of those conditions. And interestingly, those, you know, when people started doing population-wide screening, they, they show up in the general population as well. And people who are not clinically diagnosed with anything, although they do have some effects on cognitive functioning, um, for example. So we have a, a picture already of discrete mut rare mutations predisposing to risk of lots of different um, conditions where different individuals with the same mutation can end up with different um, phenotypes. The same thing is true for um, the, the genes that have been found by exome sequencing or, or genome sequencing, some of which are shown here and here for, um, for schizophrenia in particular. And one of the really important points on this graph is that the, um, the, the greater the odds ratio, so the greater the risk conferred by the particular mutation, the lower the frequency in the population, which is strong evidence that they're under negative selection. So, which doesn't, you know, that's not a surprise. Having schizophrenia or having autism or any of these conditions really is a, a, a huge fitness burden in terms of having offspring. So these kinds of mutations are under negative selection all the time. <clears throat> um, I think just the sort of, the, the trend is that the pool, the idiopathic pool is shrinking as we develop these new techniques, which are allowing us to find different kinds of uh, mutations and, and assess their pathogenicity. So over time, that pool is, is shrinking, which suggests that, um, that the, the picture maybe of develop, neurodevelopmental disorders is that they're individually rare, but they're collectively common. So maybe these big pools that we thought were, you know, some people thought are real autism or real schizophrenia are actually just comprised uh, of these sort of rare genetic conditions. And I think there's some truth to that, but that's a simplification, as I'll show you in a minute. So one thing that's really important, though, is, well, first of all, uh, this picture, when there's, there's hundreds of mutations potentially that can give rise or to, to, to these um, kinds of conditions, is important, first of all, for, for getting rid of the idea that there must be some reason why these conditions persist in the population. There must be some benefit to them or some balancing selection or something like that. There absolutely doesn't have to be. You can just have mutation selection balance acting so these mutations are really selected against, 
but new ones arise all the time just because mutation happens. Um, and, and if that's true in that model, then the disease persists at a certain prevalence. The prevalence is actually just determined by the size of the mutational target. How many genes are there in the genome that can be mutated that will give you that kind of phenotype? And so what this means is that the, the, you know, the, these conditions are really prevalent. You know, overall, it may be anywhere between 5 and 10% of the population in terms of lifetime prevalence for one of these conditions. Um, and it's just the case that mutations in any one of hundreds of different genes can lead to these phenotypes. And that, for me, requires an explanation. Right? It's not, why, why would it be that mutations in these genes that encode proteins that do all kinds of diverse things can lead to these particular manifestations that we see as, as these you know, named categories of, of psychiatric um, illness? And, and is there some kind of common mediating phenotype? And of course, the hope in the genetics is to tell you that. Um, and it has, but it's not the answer, I think, that maybe some people were hoping for in the sense that if you look at, at, at those risk genes from, this is just from the rare variants now, they're generally enriched for brain expression, uh, especially fetal brain expression, which obviously supports a neurodevelopmental origin, um, and for neuronal expression. And those are all good reality checks that they're you know, in the, the right kinds of genes, and they're enriched for neurodevelopmental processes. But that's about it. That's about as far as it goes, really, from my perspective, at least. Um, the, the list of genes is just incredibly diverse. The protein functions are incredibly diverse. Generally speaking, if you, if you impact those genes, something bad can happen to neural development, but it doesn't get a lot more specific than that. It's not the case, for example, that schizophrenia is associated with mutations in dopaminergic pathway genes, or that you know, depression is associated with mutations in serotonergic pathway genes. So that, that sort of hope that there might be some biochemical specificity in terms of neural pathways or neurotransmitter pathways didn't, didn't pan out. Um, now, I told you that that, that picture of the, uh, the, the idiopathic terms being just umbrella terms, really, for lots of Mendelian disorders is too simple. There's lots of remaining complexity. We've already seen some of that with like 22Q11, where different patients have very different presentations. So why, why is that? Why don't their inheritance patterns look more Mendelian? Um, and why are those effects so variable? So there's at least three possible explanations. One is genetic background, which is at play. The other is environmental factors, uh, stressors, which are likely also at play, although they're hard to track down. Uh, and then the third is intrinsic developmental variation, which I'll talk about um, a bit. So first of all, on genetic modifiers, that there's nothing strange or unusual or exotic about that. Every um, Mendelian condition has genetic modifiers to even sort of classic ones like cystic fibrosis. Not for the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis itself, that's really associated with one mutation, but for the severity of different phenotypes. So depending on how you define your phenotype, the penetrance or expressivity of your mutations will, will, will vary. So um, it's, it's very clear that these kinds of conditions are modified by either other rare mutations in the background or by general polygenic background effects. And the same thing uh, is happening with these psychiatric mutations as well. So um, rather than thinking there's one sort of genetic architecture that explains all of these different conditions, I think it's likely that there's a, really a, a spectrum. Um, and you may have in you know, some cases, especially of de novo mutations, that are really highly penetrant. The reason that we only see them de novo is because they're so highly penetrant. So people who don't have children when they have those mutations, right? So those are ones that occur over and over again. They're, they're much more frequent in sporadic cases as opposed to ones where there's multiplex inheritance in a family. But then you can also have um, you know, conditions where you're inheriting mutations that are, that are modified by a general background or by epistatic interactions with in maybe two or three or four or 10 rare mutations at a time. Um, and those ones are really hard to find because the uh, sort of statistical burden of, of testing all the pairwise combinations gets really um, intense. But I think there's good evidence that that, that, that mechanism exists anyway. Um, now, of course, so, so you know, each of us carries maybe 70 de novo mutations, lots, hundreds of thousands of rare inherited ones from recent generations back. And then millions of common variants from many, many generations back that have spread through the population. Now, the reason they spread through the population is because they're almost neutral. 
Uh, they, they have tiny, tiny individual effects, so natural selection can't do much about them. Um, if they have big effects, they get selected against, but they can still uh, um, increase risk and especially can do that collectively. And of course, that's what genome-wide association studies have been looking for, and they've been very successful for um, schizophrenia. Autism is kind of catching up in terms of, of sample sizes and, and, and hits. Um, this was from about 2014, where the overall polygenic score, if you taught up all of these um, alleles, explained about 7% of the variance on the liability scale for this, um, for this condition. I don't know, it's, it's about 10% now, maybe, I think. Um, so there's lots and lots of these. They have tiny individual effects, but collectively can make a substantial contribution to risk. Again, even though they're common, you can still see that they're under negative selection. Um, and again, the risk is shared across diagnostic categories. So this is a nice paper that came out just recently showing the overlap in, in polygenic score risk prediction for um, these different conditions. So you've got bipolar and, and depression, you've got um, ADHD and schizophrenia, and they all show significant overlap. It's not complete, right? You know, there's still some um, distinction, but very much a shared kind of a picture without a lot of specificity that would explain why there's a difference between bipolar disorder and, and ADHD. If, you know, if you're looking for an explanation at the level of the genes, you're not going to find it directly. So, um, so overall, again, they have uh, you know nervous system expression, very diverse functions. The only sort of processes that are enriched at all are neurodevelopmental processes. Again, pretty generally, no biochemical specificity. So, my feeling is that that background just reflects developmental robustness, which is how well the genome as a whole can channel development into a typical sort of viable range. Right? Um, and that, that ability will also manifest as an ability to buffer the effects of rare mutations or environmental insults or just general noise during development. Um, so the, the, the prediction of that, which is borne out by this and many other studies, is that if you look in cases who have a rare mutation, the ones that are more penetrant, right, the more severe mutations, they don't need to have a polygenic score that also sort of increases the risk because it's big enough hit by itself. The ones with less penetrant mutations tend to have higher polygenic scores. So consistent with the idea that some people can buffer those effects, whereas other people who have this higher polygenic score suggesting lower developmental robustness can't buffer the effects the same way. Um, so you can think about that, or at least I do, um, in this kind of a way where you've got you know, these various potential mechanisms of, of rare mutations are sort of filtered through the polygenic burden. And I put sex effects there as well, because um, males generally are, are uh, likely just less robust neurodevelopmentally. And I'll come back to a reason why that, um, why that is. But that'll give us an, an overall picture of genomic risk. Um, now, that's not the full picture because we know, first of all, that these are disorders are highly heritable, but they're not completely heritable. So some other sources of variance must be at play. And really what's inherited is the risk, not the disorder itself. So, um, so what are these other sources of variance? Well, typically people have taken non-genetic to mean environmental. And I think that's a mistake. It doesn't have to be. Um, and in fact, if you look at, at twin studies and, and population studies, first of all, the family environment makes little effect or maybe no effect. Um, and really, there's not a lot of evidence for other systematic environmental factors either, at least not big ones um, that, that I think are enough to, to explain all of the remaining variants. So there's something missing in my view uh, that, that we need to, have to explain why monozygotic twins are not completely the same as each other. And um, they're often not concordant for these kinds of conditions. So. Um, Really, I think that's just development. It's just development itself is just a noisy process. Um, the, the risk plays out in an individual way every time you run development, basically. So it's a probabilistic, um, it's a probabilistic process inherently. You don't need to appeal to anything outside the organism as an extra source of variance to explain why one person goes this trajectory and another person goes like that. And I just want to illustrate that with a couple of things. First of all, just generally the program of development is obviously incredibly complex, but it's also noisy in that it's, it, the components are 
you know, it's not hardware, it's wetware. These are jiggly proteins. Once the genome, you know, makes some proteins, well, they go off and they bind and they unbind and they, you know, they, they, they move over here and they move over there and the genes get turned off and on. It's, all of those are probabilistic, um, noisy, slightly stochastic processes. And of course, the, you know, evolution has made it so that the organism can deal with that noise. Right? So it still can channel everything into the way that it wants to go, but it doesn't deal with it completely. In fact, the, its ability to buffer some of that noise is why it can tolerate genetic variation. Right? It has evolved to be able to have some, some wiggle room in its components. That means genetic variation can be tolerated and can build up, but that genetic variation itself undermines the ability to buffer the, um, the overall effects. So in any case, the genome doesn't have enough information in it to specify an outcome in terms of every cell and every synapse in your brain. It just specifies the rules whereby um, that, that program plays out. And you don't get the identical result every time you run that. And you can see that in identical twins, just in, in physical features. These two happen to be very similar to each other. But if you look for a minute, they're not the same as each other um, in, in physical morphology. And you can see the same thing in, in brain morphology where on the left here, you've got um, twins in the, the left and right hemispheres, and the um, colors are showing the correlation in this, it happens to be cortical thickness uh, as an MRI measure, and some parts of the brain between monozygotic twins are really, really highly correlated, the ones in sort of purpley colors and red, but some of them are actually much less. There's a lot of variation even between identical twins, and that's true even um, at much earlier ages than shown here, whereas fraternal twins um, obviously are much less. So, you know, cortical, you, you can look at this picture and say, well, cortical structure is really highly heritable and genetically driven, but it's also not completely heritable. So there's some noise there. So generally speaking, to get from, from genotypes to phenotypes, you have to go through development and that just adds variation. It can just add quantitative variation, you know, in, in height or in facial features or cortical thickness or something like that. But one of the really crucial aspects here is that brain development is really a nonlinear process. There are all these sorts of contingencies and cascades uh, of, of events that have to happen for the next event to happen properly. So tiny differences at, at, at um, early stages can really cascade across subsequent stages and lead to dichotomous outcomes. And I think that's likely happening for um, you know, conditions like uh, schizophrenia or autism. It likely happens for handedness and sexual orientation. I want to just show you one example um, which is agenesis of the corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum is the connections between the two hemispheres. There's millions and millions of axons that go across there in human brain. Um, in a mouse brain, there's hundreds of thousands of axons that go across. And this is a, a coronal section of a, of a sort of a postnatal mouse brain, um, early postnatal. And what it's showing is that the, um, so the, the cortex is, is, um, is up here on either side. And what is shown, these red axons here are the pioneers. So they pioneer the corpus callosum. Initially, the two hemispheres are not connected at all. These few axons pioneer that, um, make a little bridge, and then everybody else goes across, right? Hundreds of thousands of other ones can get across. But for these little guys to get across, actually a, a small bridge has to form, these blue cells right in the middle of the brain. There's only you know, several hundred cells there. They have to fuse. If they fuse, then the red axons, the pioneers can get across, and then everybody else can get across. If these guys don't fuse at this very particular point of development, nobody gets across. So it's an all or none um, outcome. And you can see the, the, what the phenotypes look like if you have a normal corpus callosum or one where there's no connections at all. Um, and what you find is that you know, different strains of mice can have that phenotype at different penetrants, but it's completely probabilistic from one animal to the next. So you can have, um, you know, it might be 70%, 30%. Um, and if you breed the ones that have a corpus callosum, their offspring, it's still 70%, 30%. It doesn't matter. What's, it, what's inherited is, is the risk, and it just plays out in the individual. And you can see the same thing in humans. These are triplets, um, one of whom has a normal corpus callosum, and the other two are completely missing the corpus callosum. Um, now, you, you might uh, say, well, okay, um, 
So one way to think about that is, is with this um, visual metaphor from um, Conrad Waddington, which is fairly famous, called the epigenetic landscape. Epigenetic here doesn't mean anything to do with chromatin biology. It just refers to epigenesis from the idea of, of the organism emerging through development. Um, so he, he thought of this as a way to think about how different cell types get specified during, uh, during embryogenesis, but I, I like to think of it as a way just to think about the way development goes for the whole organism. So the idea is that um, as development proceeds, uh, the, the, the little ball is the sort of the state of the organism at any stage, and it's got various um, trajectories that it can follow. And it could be a, a you know a, a, a typical trajectory or say schizophrenia, and at some points along the way, a little bit of noise can nudge it one way or another. But then the self-organizing properties of, of brain development will continue to channel it in that way. That's the idea. Um, now, one of the things that's important here, I think, is that. This, thinking about the sort of variability or randomness is, is a bit of a head wrecker because it, it, there's a natural sort of uh, feeling that you have to think of, well, it's coming from somewhere. It must be some positive force that's acting on it, right? And I think that's the wrong way to think about it. I think it's actually a negative. It's just a lack of constraint. So the genome is not fully constraining how the thing goes. And in fact, the degree of constraint will vary depending on the genetics of the person, but it has to go, right? Development is going to make it go. It has to go one way or the other. So you've got this impetus that's driving it along and then this lack of constraint, but it's going to go one way or another. And those non-linearities will then channel it into these different, um, into these different phenotypes. Um, and just in case you're, you're thinking, well, okay, those, you know, those different mice, well, maybe it was something outside the, the embryo. You don't, you know, you don't know that it was really inherent noise. Maybe it was something outside. Um, well, you see the same thing, uh, you know, within animals. This is just arb arbitrarily chosen for my own work. Um, of the the top panel here is um, a mutant a mutant mouse on the right hand side, where one of the this is a little bundle of the fornix output of the hippocampus cross section like that. Um, and this is what it looks like in a wild type animal, and that's in this mutant where one of the one forms perfectly fine, and one of them is is um, very deep vesiculated with far fewer axons in it. It's completely probabilistic which side it is. And even actually at the single cell level, in um, this is in Drosophila, motor neuron innervation of muscles in the abdominal wall, where you see the exact same single cell has a name and everything, where you see from from segment to segment to segment to segment, and you just get a probabilistic kind of a, an outcome. Okay, so, so generally then, if we go back to, to this big picture, we have the overall genomic risk, uh, uh, sort of a combination of rare mutations and, and polygenic load. That gets filtered in a way through developmental variation and, and, and then can give you a, a wide range of outcomes, uh, one of which can be no clinical issues, um, but the other can be what you can broadly call developmental brain dysfunction, which then can manifest in many different ways clinically. Um, depending on some other things that we don't really understand. Now, there's a wrinkle here, which I think is really the, the main point that I want to get to, which is that when you think about this you know, genetic variation going through developmental variation, leading to these innate differences, that actually genetic variation affects the developmental variation. Developmental variation is a genetic trait itself. So uh, if you think about developmental robustness, and put it in the positive sense, um, it, it reflects that overall integrity of the genomic program or what you can call genomic reserve by analogy to cognitive reserve in psychiatry. That should be, and actually demonstrably is, degraded by an increasing load of genetic variants. So the more mutations you add to, to the genome, you're not just pushing it into one other particular phenotype, you're just increasing the variance generally and, 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 and decreasing the ability to buffer uh, effects of other things. And I think there's evidence for that from, for example, the fact that the polygenic component of risk, um, which is a sort of a general psychopathology factor, um, inversely correlates with genetic scores for IQ, for example. For most conditions, at least, there's, a, there's, a, there's an anomaly with, with autism, which uh, I think is unexplained, and I don't know quite what to make of it, um, where there's an increased with risk with higher genetic IQ uh, polygenic scores, but my feeling is that's likely an artifact uh, um, 
somehow. But so generally, my view then is that actually that polygenic in index is really a generic kind of index of vulnerability. It's tracking developmental robustness. That's the trait that we're actually tracking. The other things are just a manifestation of it. So, so the idea is that you can have robust genotypes where the range of outcomes is narrow and they're better able to buffer at the effects of mutations. And you'll have sensitive genotypes with a higher mutational load where the range of outcomes is much broader. And just to get back to the, um, to the sex issue, I think that supports this idea because males are more vulnerable to, to um, these conditions. And they're also just more variable in everything. Basically, every trait that you happen to want to measure in males where there's an XY um, chromosomal sex inheritance system, the males who have only one X chromosome are more variable in all kinds of traits, all kinds of anatomical traits, all kinds of physiological traits. And that's true in humans, and it's true in, in lots of other mammalian species as well. And interestingly, if you look at birds, which have the opposite um, inheritance system where the females are the ones with two different sex chromosomes, a Z and a W chromosome, they're the ones that show greater variability in that instance. So the idea is that, that having only one X chromosome just exposes you to all of the genetic variation on that chromosome and thereby in decreases this developmental robustness generally. Um, so, so I think that fits with the idea, although it doesn't explain everything about the, the male um, increase. Okay, so, um, so just to go back to this idea, this, this landscape. So this is what Waddington's original figure, and this is, the, this is the famous one that you see a lot, but the one that you don't see so much is what was supposed to be underneath this, what's shaping the genetic landscape for any individual, which was this idea of these guy ropes and pulleys and things like that that are pulling on this sort of canvas and shaping the, the depth or, or, or height of the various valleys, which means the probability of going into one phenotype versus another. So these little things here, what's pulling them down is the genes, right? So those are the genetic variants that each person has that shape that, um, that, shape that landscape. And really what I'm saying is that we should think about differences in genetic variation as a collective, right? A collective expression on, on the phenotypic, the likelihood of, of various phenotypic outcomes, as opposed to wanting one gene to specify one kind of outcome, because that's simply not the way the system works. Um, and, and as well as thinking just about, you know, decreasing the likelihood of one and, and increasing the likelihood of another, we also can think of just flattening, just flattening out the, the landscape and, and thereby increasing the variance that you see. That helps me think about it. I don't know if it um, is helpful to everybody else, but um, helps me. Okay. Um, now, we didn't, we answered one of these questions, kind of, the top question here, why do mutations in the same gene lead to diverse phenotypes? Well, we have, you know, genetic vari variation in the background. We have developmental variation, which is just inescapable. But this other question, the flip side of that, why do mutations in so many different genes lead to similar phenotypes? We haven't really answered, and I think we have to look to development for the answer to that as well. And, and really, you can ask, why do we see those phenotypes and not other ones? Because there's a sort of an arbitrariness to the nature of psychiatric disorders, right? I mean, we see certain things, and of course, we focus on what we do see, but there's an immense possible space of ways that the mind could go awry that we don't see, and we don't notice that, but it's huge, right? So there, we need an explanation for why we see some particular things, and also why they're, some of the aspects of them are qualitatively novel. Right? They're not just a decrement in, in function. New novel psychological states emerge. Um, I think that requires explanation too, and the explanation is probably not in the genes themselves that are, that are the risk factors. So for example, psychosis as an emergent uh, qualitatively novel state can be associated with all kinds of things. In, both in, in, um, in humans and in, actually in animals as well. So uh, infection with syphilis or mal malaria or HIV, for example, all kinds of drugs affecting dopaminergic pathways, serotonergic, glutamatergic, um, cannabinoids, and so on, loads of genetic insults, hundreds of rare variants, and so on. So really, there's nothing specific in the genes that is linked to this outcome in any sort of sensible, direct, proximal way. It's an emergent kind of phenotype. It's a property of the brain. It's a property of the perturbed brain, not the perturbations. And that's different 
from the logic that we bring to a lot of genetic um, approaches for other kinds of diseases. So in this case, I think we have genetic origins, but we have neural mechanisms that are emergent through the processes of development where the functions of the encoded gene products really don't relate proximally or synchronously to the phenotypes that you see, the symptoms that we see in, in, in patients. For the most part, there are some exceptions. So typically the logic of genetic analysis is that if we understand um, the relation of genotypes to phenotypes, that is mutant variants to phenotypic outcomes, there will be some kind of corresponding logic to what the gene does and the functions of the gene products. And, and let me give you an example with microcephaly. So microcephaly is caused by a smaller uh, head, characterized by a smaller head, which is caused by a smaller brain, um, which is due to uh, alterations in neuronal proliferation in the cerebral cortex. The genes that have been found, at least many of them, are directly involved in controlling neuronal proliferation in the cerebral cortex, right? You've got a really concrete anatomical phenotype that's quite specific, and you've got the genes that you find are doing that job, right? They're really involved. The proteins they make are really involved in the process that you're, that you're looking at, that you see a perturbation in. Now, that's not the case for psychiatric conditions because the processes we're looking at are the highest levels of cognition. And, and perception and sense of self and language, um, really the, the, the most sort of emergent functions of the mind, not just um, you know, particular aspects of, of neural function. So I like to use this uh, analogy where if you had say a complicated system like a fighter jet and you were looking for defects that cause a defect in turbine function. Well, if you randomly look for defects, the ones that you would find would be these ones, right? Bits of the turbine would be the ones that cause a defect in turbine function. And that would be like looking for a microcephaly. But if you look for defects in performance, well, you're going to find everything, right? Anything in there is going to affect the performance of the plane. It's an emergent property of the whole system, all the components and the way that they interact with each other in a way that, that just defies any kind of direct um, logic in, in um, or, or relationship between individual bits and the outcome. So there aren't genes, I think, for autism or for schizophrenia. That's not the nature of the relationship between genetics um, and these phenotypes. And they're not even genes for the cognitive processes that are affected in those um, conditions, I think. They're genes for neural development or function or plasticity um, that affect those processes. And, and we can think about the pathological states, states like, like mania or psychosis or depression, as emergent properties. And this is a, a term that I use advisedly called failure modes, which is not supposed to be judgmental. It's an engineering term, which refers to the idea that any complex system, especially dynamical systems, will have some sort of operating regimes that it's been designed for in uh, in, in artificial systems, or that it's been selected for in biological systems. But when you start messing with it, it's going to have some unanticipated weird behavior. That's just a, practically a law of dynamical systems. So the, the idea that uh, you, we can think about these, these states as like uh, attractors, where you may have a, you know, a, a deep attractor um, well, which would be our typical um, operating regime, typical outcome of, of development in a, in a healthy brain, but the brain can be pushed into a maladaptive regime uh, or a different one that may correspond to things like uh, mania or, or psychosis or anxiety and so on. Um, and at that, at that stage, this is nothing to do with the genes that lead to the vulnerability to be pushed into those things which is really frustrating because it means that the, you know, the goal of genetics to get at the biology at that level um, is, is obviously more difficult. So just to sum up then, um, and, and I mean, this is my, my view, my overview, not everyone agrees with all of this, but for me at least, the genetics is both heterogeneous and polygenic, so the worst of all worlds combined. Um, there aren't really clear processes or pathways that are very specific. What really emerges is neurodevelopment generally. Um, so it may be that the genetics of neurodevelopmental disorder risk just is the genetics of developmental robustness, at least to some degree, maybe not completely. The, excuse me, the pathology is not closely linked to the genetic um, etiology, and, and it may be better to think of those conditions and the symptoms 
as emergent phenotypes. So if we go back to these goals of, of genetics, well, we have identified risk genes, lots and lots of them. It's kind of revealed the underlying biology, but it, it has revealed it to be not very specific, I would say. Um, and so in translating that understanding to the clinic, well, it hasn't really happened very much, um, except in the sense that, you know, genetic diagnosis for rare conditions have some implications for management. They haven't really translated to, you know, personalized medicine kind of thing, this model that came from, you know, cancer biology, say, where cancers are really proximal molecular defect, cellular defect. The genes that predispose to that are the things that are doing, causing that defect. And once you find these, you may have, you know, druggable targets that, that you can build on. I, I don't think that's going to be the case for psychiatric conditions, even though it was the hope. Um, and some people still, I think, push that, push that line. But the phenotypes are, are not um, directly due to proximal molecular functions, in my view. And in fact, they're, they're probably due to impaired gene function during development. Maybe not even any more to requirements for the gene in adults. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um, so, you know, for a lot of these things, you won't treat the altered outcome of development by tweaking the, the gene itself again or the genes or some pathway after the fact. I think what we'll have to do is realize that actually in these, for these conditions, genetics has us, uh, you know, gives us information about the etiology, but it doesn't give us information about, about the pathology. The pathology is emergent through pathogenic mechanisms that go across different levels and we'll have to combine work across all of those levels and many different fields to really make progress, uh, in my view. And, and development is the, is the line that links all of these um, things. So I, I mean, actually, I'm really optimistic about this. I know I sound pessimistic, like this is impossible. I, I don't think it's impossible. I just think it's going to take a different approach than this sort of hopeful idea that genetics would just get us there all by itself. I think it's going to take a picture kind of like this. Now, what I do think is that genetics will really help us do the neuroscience and help us do the cellular work and the systems level work because it will give us entities, these uh, you know, people with the same mutation where we can model them in mice and we know what we're dealing with, not, to, not to these big nebulous sort of di diagnostic um, clouds where that, that really hid loads of heterogeneity. So the genetics can really help us, I think, but we'll still have to do all of these um, other, other work to, to get to a point where it pays off, I think, in, in terms of um, new, new treatment. And I will leave it there. And as George said, I will plug <laughs> that just because I can. Thanks very much for your attention. Thanks, Kevin. That was just a really fascinating. Uh, I'll stop sharing so we can look at it. Yeah. Okay. Don't, don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we take your questions in the uh, Q and A. And so, so oh, so we'll read the first question on, uh, online uh, is from Ezra Sussa. Hi, Ezra. Shame you're not here. Uh, great talk and see it overall the same way, but don't understand why I dismiss environmental contributions. So, so strong evidence that environment causes matter and the environmental interventions can reduce risk of NDDs, e.g. iodine, folic acid, et cetera. Yeah, um, well, that's a perfectly fair point. And I, yeah, I should, I mean, I, I shouldn't dismiss them altogether because things, certain things like folic acid and iodine and, and you know, ones of direct maternal nutrition, uh, we clearly see there is a, an effect. The question, I guess, is whether, um, you know, those make up major sort of systematic sources of variants across the population as opposed to more isolated um, more isolated conditions. And I guess it's arguable uh, to the, the extent to which they do. I mean, so, so a way into that, which I'm sure I sort of go on to <laughs> who's here, uh, is that if you, see, if you see things that differ hugely across time and space, like neural, mm -hmm. neural tube defects differ yeah, yeah. hugely across time and space, there must be something environmental uh, under, underlying it. And the genetics can then point you to the environment as MTHFR points as the folate for neural tube yeah, defects yeah, yeah. for situations where there's not so much, there's not evidence from that or external evidence of different differences, you, you know, you're not can't be so sure you'll find things. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true for for neural tube defects. I think it's I think it's evident for neural tube defects, yeah. right? I mean, the evidence is really strong. I think the evidence is not as strong for things like schizophrenia and and autism, 
And I mean, you know, the challenge there is that rates of autism, for example, diagnosis have massively changed over, over the years, which obviously many people then say, well, there must be environmental causes there. Yeah. Um, but of course there's diagnostic yeah. practice causes. So um, yeah, it gets, it gets complicated. And really, I mean, the main ones when I, that I was uh, referring to in terms of the lack of, of evidence for environmental factors with schizophrenia and autism. But again, it's, it's arguable. That's the way that, I'm not saying there's no evidence, I'm saying there's not enough evidence to explain all the rest of the variants that we see. Great. No, it's a great talk. Um, and it's refreshing to uh, hear that a geneticist standing up and saying that genetics is not going to be the the answer for a complete answer anyway for neurodevelopmental disorders. My question is that the model you uh, describe is there any point in doing GWAS for schizophrenia or other disorders of higher order performance failure like yeah, yeah. ischemic heart disease? Mm -hmm. And if not, what would you suggest the way forward should be? Yeah, well, it's a great question, and and. Um, so if the goal of doing GWAS is to identify molecular components with, a, with an idea that you're going to get this sort of insight into proximal molecular pathology, th then I think the massive successes of GWAS to date have shown that that's not going to pan out. Right? And, and what I would encourage the people who do those things to do is actually look at your own data and say, These, we've really learned a lot here. What we've learned is we're not going to learn any more by doing more of that for that purpose. However, um, there's all kinds of other interesting things that you can do with the data from GWAS. Once you have polygenic scores and you can look at correlations and you can do you know, Mendelian randomization and you can use them as tools um, to, I mean, I see them more as, as research tools. I don't see a likely clinical application for psychiatric conditions. I know people are, are trying that for say heart disease and so on. Um, you know, the, the difference there is that heart disease, there's, a, there's an intervention that you can make uh, into just in terms of, you know, advising people about diet and exercise and stuff like that. It's not obvious that there's an intervention that you can make uh, in people that you identify as having a higher polygenic risk for schizophrenia, say. And what, okay, what, do you, what would you do about that clinically? Um, but that's where I probably take issue with your argument about dismissing the environmental influence as a product of the genetic makeup failing to cope, mm -hmm. rather than those factors having any real value. As the examples Ezra pointed out, or we've done work from Swedish data, for example, looking at the effect of early life infection and inflammation. Mm -hmm. And you do see effect on neurodevelopmental outcomes like IQ, cognitive performance, or later outcomes like schizophrenia when you take into account shared genetic confounding. So you do see effect of some of the environmental factors. Yeah. Well, I mean, great, then that's a great example of it, where the, the genetics can help you, um, you know, get evidence for environmental factors that, um, you know, maybe was equivocal um, prior to that. So we've got a question from Dara Audre, which was my, going to be my question. So I'm going to roll our two questions into one, which is uh, um, that Dara Audre was intrigued by suggesting the IQ autism relationship yeah. as an artifact. And uh, when I met uh, Kevin a few weeks, a few months ago, I then sent him the David Weiner paper, which in, in a series in the some simplex quads uh, demonstrates that when, when you have uh, uh, families in which one uh, child has an autism diagnosis, one child doesn't have an autism diagnosis, and you look at the transmitted polygenic score to education, the child who has the higher polygenic score for educational attainment uh, has, a, has, a, has the higher risk of being the uh, child with autism. And that was a single hypothesis test. We published mm. the hypothesis in 2016. We then tested it in the uh, in, in, in some simplex and the P to the 10 to the minus seven on a single hypothesis test that the, the child with the higher education yeah, score yeah. had the higher risk. I got through it. Is, it, is, it, it, is, it, it is it is really convincing. Um, and yet I just I, I just still don't know what to make of it. You know, I, it just um, because uh, well, I mean I can I ask I mean, it's not that I'm not, it's well, not that I'm not convinced by those things. Well, by the kids, uh, 
it, it's, uh, it's you started, know about the IQ of the kids with autism? Yeah, they're not, not um, they have reduced, uh, they have, yeah, the kids with autism have reduced IQ, yeah. In that study? Yeah. In that study, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, they, they were recruited, as we know, there's more an idea of it, but they were, they were recruited um, uh, before the, the, the really, you know, they were recruited quite a while ago. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, would, uh, would fulfil classic um, diagnostic criteria. I mean, it seems to me that educational, I mean, sort of extremes of educational uh, attainment ability, why we should think that that's always a good thing, probably in 200,000 years of Homo sapiens. It's not, it's, it's probably not a great thing. Mm -hmm. It's a, a mixture of uh, sort of arrogance and de deference when necessary. <laughs> you know, think about what things lead to, to high education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, on, uh, they, I mean, they, they could be part of this decanalized, uh, you know, it's one end of, the, of, the, of that sort of same sort of process. Maybe we yeah, yeah, think yeah. of, and maybe we treat extreme ed educational attainment as neurodevelopmental neurodevelopmental disorder. It would yeah. end up, uh, <laughs> then, uh, I, I mean, I guess what I should have said. I mean, I really mean, misspoke saying that I think it's an artifact. I guess what I should have said is that I, I don't know what to think of it. And I mean, your your study is an exception in that you know a lot of the ones they just show a, a correlation between you know, polygenic yeah, score yeah. for educational yeah. attainment and for autism. And there's all kinds of social sort of factors that could come into play in that in terms of ascertainment biases Absolutely. and so on, and indirect effects. I mean, you looked at the transmitted versus the non-transmitted, yeah. which is the right way to, yeah. to do it. Um, but even with that, I still I still just don't know what to make of it because it, it sort of conflicts with the idea that polygenic risk for autism and schizophrenia is really overlapping. And for schizophrenia and for low IQ is really overlapping. And yet for autism, it goes the opposite direction and it doesn't seem to, I mean, maybe that just dissociates, uh, you know, along the spectrum there, but I still just don't know what to make of it. So I'm just sort of keeping my powder dry on that. And I'm like, it's sort of provisional. And when I know what to make of it, I'll, I'll, just know. <laughs> yes, well, well <laughs> there are still here. Yeah. So a question from Jack Meller. It sounds like you would argue the way forward is to identify convergent pathophysiological processes from multiple risk genes. Is that a reasonable summary? If so, what's what's your best bet? Yeah, um, that is a reasonable summary. I mean, that's the sort of um, picture, right? Is that you get multiple different mutations can lead to the same same outcomes, uh, and yet single mutations can lead to diverse outcomes. So the the way to view that for me is to see these channels uh, going, you know, one way or, or the other. And then the question is, well, why? You know, why do they go this way versus? that way and when you know is it possible to follow say high-risk mutations either in, in humans or i think probably more profitably in animal models um to to get through the, the processes of, of emergent pathogenicity um and eventual pathophysiology and i guess my hope is that at, at least at the end point those patho pathophysiological states um that the systems neuroscience methods that we have now in animals, which are, are just vastly better than they were even 10 years ago. And this sort of the, the idea of looking at, at, you know, being able to record populations of neurons in awake behaving animals and, and correlate them with behavioral states. For me, that, that's where I, I have a lot of hope that that kind of neuroscience will help us understand, uh, it can be translated more directly to the kinds of data that we can get in humans. Um, so that, that, for me, would be the hope um, that we can do those in parallel and where the genetics, as I said, gives you an anchor and lets you know that you're at least looking at the same sort of thing. Right? You're comparing apples with apples. Um, yeah, but it's going, to be a, it's going to be a long road, I think. And we'll have one in the room and then this one. Uh, Nick? Uh, thanks for that. It was terrific. Um, one of the sort of themes you talked about was the, the notion of constraint. And, and in other walks of life, I guess it's regulation. You know, if you think about the epigenome, folk are interested in the epigenome, but they tend to measure levels rather than thinking about what allows or doesn't allow variability. Mm -hmm. And, and that, I think is a, a, the challenge and the question is, if we're interested in that, so development is happening, yes, it's underlined, but it's variable. And it's, you know, what we're seeing is pathologies, which are the ultimate end game for those chance events with perturbations fine. How do we start to understand heritable contributions to constraint and how do we search for, let's say, selection for constraint rather than yeah. just variation? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a great, that's a super question. And actually, I mean, in, in humans, it's really obviously really hard to do that, but you can in, in animal models and people do. Right? I mean, people do 
um, genetic screens for increases in the variance of a phenotype without changing the mean of a phenotype. So you, you can actually dissociate that in, you know, in yeast and flies, all kinds of even behavioral phenotypes in flies. You can breed for increasing diversity of behavior, variance around the mean without shifting the mean. So, um, so it is possible in that sense to uh, get at the, the sort of genetic architecture of constraint, I think. It's not, it's, that's not to say that it's easy. And every time you're dealing with noisy stuff, right? If noise is the, or variability is the object of study, that just becomes really difficult, which is why people generally have ignored it as a nuisance, right? And focused on the things that are more systematic. So studying non-systematic stuff, obviously is just more challenging. Um, but yeah, it is possible to do it. And I think, again, like with the um, systems neuroscience approaches, I think there's actually a move towards more systems biology and genetics as well, moving away from this sort of simple idea of this is the gene for X and that's the gene for Y to a view of the genome as a whole, um, sort of in, in embodying a really a generative model to use a term from AI, where the, the goal of the genome is to uh, embody the processes that will lead to the self-organization of an organism within a viable range. Um, and that basically involves creating what's essentially a collective energy landscape, which is exactly what Waddington's metaphor showed. And I think, you know, from, from neuroscience and AI these days, we can see that that actually is formally correct. Like it's, mathemat it's mathematically modelable like that. It's, it's the right way to think about it. Um, and again, I think we're, there's tools now where we can get that kind of systems-wide data. You know, all the genes monitor, all the gene expression, you know, single cells through time um, that we just couldn't do 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So my hope is that genetics and neuroscience together actually will move to a more sort of holistic view of development uh, as well as a neural function. So we'll have the last question. Another old friend, Beate Sampersen, is online. Uh, says, amazing talk, thank you. To what extent do you think polygenic effect, TG in SSC, are distorted through bias, while rare variation effects are little affected by it? Um, the, that would be ascertainment bias, I presume. Um, I think there's a lot of scope for them to be affected by bias. I don't really know enough about the um, collection procedures for the just the Simon Simplex collection in particular, right? Um, I guess you know whether whether you expect rare more rare variation or more de novo variation will will depend on whether the the inheritance is is more sporadic or simplex versus uh, multiplex. Um, whether, you know, the, the polygenic variation, I think, may absolutely vary if it's tracking parents' educational levels and, and is affecting recruitment into the study. But I don't know the details within that particular study of the design that led to it, but it's a, it's a challenge. It's one, of the, it's one of the reasons why I'm but then I, confused, I guess, by the, the educational attainment. Because of, because of the between um, siblings is, to, is, yeah, yeah. is, is, men, is meiosis sure. plus uh, fertilization. Absolutely. So it's um, so unless, this, yeah, unless yeah. there's some um, bizarre uh, transmission ratio distortion. Yeah. But I think which, which, question... which, is, which is possible when, um, and MOBA will be able to look at. Because it's, it's, you know, it, it, it is true randomized data. Oh yeah, no, that it's data not, is. I took this question yeah, to be more yeah, general about the yeah. uh, about the cohort, and I think you know any cohort like the UK Biobank has yeah, its, yeah, its own biases yeah. uh, they all do. So. Yeah. yeah. So oh, okay, this is definitely the last question. Oh, sorry. I didn't <laughs> sure, yeah, no, no. Um, your penultimate slide and what you're saying a bit more about neurology suggests that you might expect to see more um, systematic relationships if you looked at. Uh, measures of neurology rather than genes. Yeah. Phenotypes, but that's yeah. not true, is it? I mean, not well, uh, not at the level that people have looked, right? I mean, so you know, not with fMRI or not with structural MRI, and not really with EEG. You know, I mean, people have no. tried to Indeed. to look for correlates of autism, right? Yeah. Uh, but maybe what they should be looking at is correlates of symptom dimensions. Well, Although even even that with that, that hasn't really panned out no. so well. So there's there's a couple ways to think about that. One is that that these are, uh, you know, you, you can have high anxiety or you can have depression or mania for lots of different 
brain reasons, right? Uh, and that's perfectly viable hypothesis. The other is that we just haven't, you know, the tools that we've been using are just too crude. Mm -hmm. And we haven't looked at it in terms of the system. You know, the, we haven't analyzed them as dynamical systems uh, in the right way with the right kinds of data. And I think that's also possibly true, but I don't, I think I they're both perfectly say, open. We may want to look more within family variation because mm -hmm. uh, that hasn't generally been done. But if you look at the brain, you know, now faces in, within the family are similar. You can see those sorts of similarities in things like structural brain imaging. Yeah, yeah. And so I think it's just that we're dealing with a phenomenon that's hugely variable yeah. with massive individual variation anyway. And we're not, we could control for that better by well, family based studies, we, both affected and unaffected. Absolutely. Or by, or by uh, focusing on patients who all have the same rare mutations. And there are, I think, better sort of um, data coming out, people looking at you know, patients with 22Q11 or 16P11 or somewhere where once you group them together like that, actually you can see some yes. reasonably consistent MRI kind of findings. So, so the genotype first, that was sort of what I was getting at is that, that using the genetics to inform the neuroscience yeah. will be a productive route forward, I think. Yeah. So just uh, Kevin's around uh, in the afternoon from 3 to 5.30. I'm yeah. assuming that's fine. And if people would like to meet, then uh, Meg will keep a uh, list and, uh, uh, and so there's Kevin's around to have a chat. And if anyone online, uh, he could have an online chat. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so Meg, so Meg in the uh, in the office can take uh, we'll, we'll get a schedule. Great. So thanks again, okay. Thank Really you. great. To